All right, very class. We're here for right, right class, right Saturday. Yeah. Roses tomorrow. Well, some people I'm sure are like, oh, I thought roses were today. But uh, yeah, berries today, roses tomorrow, same time. We're open nine to five, so we kind of simplified things and just made all the classes at 10 this year. So there's 10, 11, 10, 11. It was like, how about 10? Makes my life easier too. So, so berries today. Uh, thanks for coming. We're going to show uh, some Super Bowl preview games today. No, I'm just kidding. It'll be a berry show. You'll see some pictures on there. Uh, I'll be curious after class. I'll ask to see how well you saw the TVs. We're trying to figure out like, should we shade this? Put a, I had kind of a ghetto looking cover over them that didn't look very swell. So we took those off this morning, but, but to hopefully be able to see them enough. And we got certainly some, some plants up here as well. So um, I'm Trevor, our general manager here. Thanks for coming. Who's new to classes at Sunnyside? Nice, welcome. We got one. And who's been here too many times? I see a few familiar faces. Yes, yes. Okay, there you go. It's nice to be back live. Uh, it was fun doing them on Zoom, but I got tired of talking to the camera, so it's fun to have some faces in the classroom again to, uh, to do some live classes. Uh, we're going to go fast and furious. There's a lot of berries to talk about. Um, we'll do questions at the end. I think what I'll do is kind of pause like after we talk about blueberries. Anybody got a question? Then raspberries. Anybody got a question? We'll kind of do it that way at the end. Free for all. Ask me about viburnum or fresno daphne or anything else. I don't, I don't really care. So. Um, I'll stay as long as you like. I'm here till five. If you want to hang out till five, so um, so ask me questions after it would be great. Uh, we'll talk. We'll touch a little bit on pruning, and I'm not saying don't ask me about pruning. But if you missed the class, it's on our YouTube channel. Uh, we do a specific class now in January called Pruning for Production, and that covered all fruit, all berries. It, it gets really tough to try to talk about how to grow these things and prune them in the same hour. Otherwise, we'll be here for, for two hours and you'll all be falling asleep in the in the chairs in here. So, um, so go back and watch the video if you like, or again, ask me after class. I'm happy to talk pruning um, anytime about that stuff too. Okay. So we'll kind of whip through. You know, if we talk about some general, <coughs> excuse me, some general things for, first, or just about growing berries. You know, we want to have full sun and we want to have well-drained soil. The one exception to that we'll talk about is blueberries. If you've seen blueberry farms, um, I live right above Lowell and Everett. I think there is about four million high bush blueberries planted in the valley and they are underwater right now, which they don't mind. Um, so that's the one exception that we can maybe have a little bit more wet. But everything else we talk about, we're going to want to have moist but well-drained soil, especially in the winter when things are dormant. We don't want too much moisture um, on the root system and as much sun as we can. You know, six hours is kind of always the rule. <clears throat> the more the better, to be honest with you, it gets me ripe earlier, gets me happy plants, um, and keeps them as dry as possible in our wet spring weather. How's that? <clears throat> um, one big thing if you're setting up a, a new berry area, you know, is this, you know, a lot of people ask about spacing, you know, how many plants should I get, you know, and this and that. <clears throat> Without looking at a picture or looking at your space, I can't answer that, but just pay attention to the specific thing we're talking about and give it room to grow. You know, packing 20 blueberries one feet apart is not going to increase your blueberry production. I'd rather have you get like four, leave them five or six feet apart and allow those things to mature and produce. If we start packing plants in little tiny areas, A, you're going to have terrible air circulation, you're going to fight disease, the sun's going to get blocked and you're just not going to get as much. So give them some room to grow. Um, watering schedule is always tough as we do this in February and it rains and rains and rains um, and it will continue to rain. I hate to remind you probably through May, maybe 4th of July on some summers, but, but uh, we'll have a lot of wet. It's not about spring. We buy new plants, yes, we want to check them for water, mulch them properly, do all those things. But as we get into summer, we can't let these things dry out. If I'm a plant, the first thing I'm going to do is bail on production. Then I'm going to bail on foliage and I'm going to try to go dormant early. That probably makes sense to most people. We get a dry summer. If I don't irrigate enough, I'm going to lose my, my berries first. Then I'm going to have my plant not look so swell. And typically they'll be alive for the next year, but they're going to try to go dormant much earlier. So make sure we irrigate a little bit in the summertime. Uh, Fertilizing is always a must. You know, I, you know I, I shouldn't say, you know, I typically feed twice a year. You know, most of my stuff, I'm all organic. We've got the fertilizers on special up here. I'll show you both, but we would feed with the appropriate organic granular usually one time about now, you know, towards first of March, and then maybe one more dose as we get into that late May, early June time frame. That will help me with waking up out of spring, and then that late spring dose, early summer, will help me get 
wood built so I'll have better production going into 2024. So that'll help me with the next season as well. Uh, with fertilizers, I'll show you both, but uh, we do them both for the class 20% off. You know, we've got organic EB stone, fruit berry vine food, fruit trees, berries, put it on pretty much anything. The one exception for this class today is blueberries. We want acidity. So you'll see on rhododendron food, they finally put it on there. I've seen my blueberry picture right on that label. If you're doing blueberries, absolutely buy the rhododendron food. That's a fertilizer I always have in my garage and I could probably use that at 90% of my yard. If you're talking conifers, broadleaves, rhodia, azalea, some of the top 10 most common plants around here and uh, blueberries would be the superior food as well because it's a little bit more acidic, okay? <coughs> Mulching, you know, I go through and mulch everything when I plant it. I mean, you should probably do that as a good rule anyway. Compost, bark, I'm not gonna tell you what to buy. Just keep in mind with bark, if it's really woody mulch like bark, that's going to degrade and take nitrogen out of my soil. So typically if we put heavy bark down, it's not the end of the world, put extra fertilizer down underneath it because that way it will draw that food out of there and not out of your soil. People that tend to bark real heavy I think have a lot of yellowy, light green, off color plants because of that nitrogen getting used up in the decomposition process. So, so keep that in mind with bark. Never had that issue with compost. That's already been degraded, pH balanced, all the rest of it. So very, very easy to do. I do like bark on blueberries. I'll be honest with you. If you're looking at a mulch for blueberries uh, with the acidity, the wood, as long as I put extra food down, I think that's the way to go typically on blueberries. The rest of the stuff I'd highly recommend going the compost route, something a little more pH neutral, a little bit of nutrients, but serves the same purpose. When I put down two, three inches of mulch on there. Again, not buried up in the center over the crown too much, although blueberries, you can get away with it. Um, the rest of it, I don't want to bury crowns. I just want to insulate that root system to, again, help my water come in that summertime. So mulch, a little bit lighter right around the plant, go a little deeper outside of it, um, and you'll be fine. The blueberries, if you've seen blueberry farms around, we got a lot of them in our area. You can pretty much do whatever you want to a blueberry, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to pop right out of it. Um, container options huge for some. You know, I live in Everett. We've had a large piece of property in Cleellum for years. I've had bigger yards. You know, I'm out of room. So if I want more berries and such, I have to put them in pots, you know, or take something out to replace it with. So I have a lot of blueberries in pots on my patio in different areas of the yard. They're really easy to grow. Uh, same with strawberries are in pots now at my place. I have a lot of pocket planters growing strawberries in them too. Um, the biggest thing is get the right soil. You know, the same as the ground. We can use this, you know, you see down below here, we can use regular potting soil for pretty much all berries. I'm not gonna hurt. If I'm planting in the ground and mixing with my soil, I'm gonna get compost. The pink bag over here is the bonus. When we swap to that, that's an acid potting soil. So that's got built-in sulfur, some extra little goodies. That is the blueberry soil of all blueberry soils to me. I plant my blueberries straight into that, like potting mix or I can use that as amendment in lieu of compost again to add more acidity in the hole. Is that making sense? So yeah, that's the, probably the one thing to go all blueberries, get the pink bag, the acid azalea camellia mix. If I'm going regular berries, compost as an amendment, or our Edna's Best organic potting soil would be the way to go in a container. Um, you know, anybody who had issues in 2022, whether it's bugs, disease, whatever that problem is, you know, keep that in mind here as we head into spring 2023. I'm not saying you got to get dormant spray and cover your whole landscape. That's not necessary. But if you had a problem with a specific thing, look at maybe some corrective prunings to get air circulation up and better sun. And also maybe spray as a good preventative. Absolutely clean up debris, all the dead berries, fruit, whatever's around that plant. Get it out of there so we can start the season clean. If you put the food down, then apply a fresh mulch over the top of that, boom, I'm ready to go for 2023 and, and off we go for another spring, okay? Um, I would always use natural organic stuff for edibles. You know, you'll find, you know, maybe a little cheaper fertilizer. It's not the end of the world. With all the trace minerals and the extra goodies in the organic foods, I think, A, they're gonna improve taste quite a bit. Um, and, and that's being not water soluble with the amount of rain we get in the spring. I'm not going to flush my fertilizer through the soil structure so fast. The organic's going to tend to sit in there and give me a much longer season of feeding a little bit slower day to day, to day. Okay? 
So just a quick little pruning, you know, again, watch the class on the YouTube from January 15th. Um, you're more than helping, you're more than welcome to ask me after class um, as far as pruning techniques and different tips you might need. Um, you can bring down pictures, sometimes helps, you know, as well. You can email these things to the store. We can always help that way. Um, but this is the perfect time. And if you haven't done it yet here, we get towards that mid-February, first part of March. It's a great time to get our thinning and pruning done on the berries. And that's all berries I'm talking about. Whether we're cleaning up the strawberry patch, then in the raspberry row, the brambles, the blueberries, all of it is the perfect time of year to kind of get some of that stuff done. Now we'll start out with something from the land down under. Let's, we'll talk kiwis here first. Who's got kiwi vines? Got a few, nice. All right. So kiwis is kind of a fun thing. You know, if you've got kiwi, how fast does yours grow a year? 15 feet, 12 feet, 10 feet? Not really. We have having problems with them. Okay, so we'll get you going. Thank you. But kiwis is a vine. That's a pretty vigorous plant. We cut ours back twice a year on our property here. If we did not, it would be probably across 40th Street near the neighbor's house by now because um, they grow fast. That's a big plant. That's not a plant I'm going to buy a cute little metal obelisk and put in a container and expect to have success for a long term. I need some room, big posts, deck, trellis, arbor, something that allow can spread out in full sun and get me the development. It's a great looking plant. If you haven't seen like fuzzy kiwi, beautiful, almost tropical looking foliage. It's a fun looking plant anyway, um, but we just need to give it some room to grow. That's not a, a miniature thing we're going to keep in a small place. Traditionally, all kiwi for my whole life 30 something years doing this is you had to buy a he and you had to buy a she and let those two do their thing i won't get into that but they had to match and mix flowers and then we got production on the female the male was just there for good looks right just like real world so so the so the uh the, the females we would get the production now this is different now the last couple years because i think gardeners have been sick and tired of do I have a he? Do I have a she? Do, what do I need? I don't get any fruit. This one died. What do I got left? I get a lot of questions on kiwis around here year round. There's no way to tell a he and a she unless you have a flower. We go back to grade school botany and think, do I see a pistol or do I see a stamen in there? And then we can tell you, oh, you've got a male plant, get a female. So now what we sell is self-fertile stuff. So this is man has created he and she on the same plant. So we have things like kiwi, we have easy names, kiwi magic, magical kiwi. I get my fruit on one plant. Sweet and solo is the, is the other one that we stock quite a bit. We get a few kiwis in, you'll see on our list online, but we tend to get the majority of self-fertile now because they have the he and the she on the same. We still get some traditional ones in as well, but uh, we want to make life easy, get one of the self-fertile ones. You don't have to worry about which one do I not have to get the production. Um, you got to give kiwi a few years to get going, you know, I usually say probably five at least, sometimes six or seven before I'm going to start getting a whole bunch of fruit on them. So we want to make sure we plant them, certainly lightly prune them fine, we feed them, we take care of them, all the rest, but we got to be a little patient until we start to get production. And then flam, you're going to have probably more uh, kiwis than you need at that point. Um, the biggest thing like I said, the last one there you can see is give them something large to grow on that's sturdy. I've seen kiwi destroy a deck. I've seen kiwi destroy a fence. That's a big woody vine that we want to make sure. I would not put it on my house. I'll be brutally honest. It'd be like, sweet, I'll build a little structure, a little fence, something off, four by four posts, something sturdy that I can train and grow it on. Now for us, <clears throat> we have a few different kinds here. So Arctic kiwi, you see that picture with the pinks and the whites? really sharp looking foliage that one we can do some shade to be honest with you that's a pretty plant whether it produces or not arctic kiwi is going to be a real small like grape sized kiwi same delicious flavor same texture but not probably the one you find the grocery store quite as much um we have to get a he and a she for arctic there's no self-fertile arctic kiwi so that's a fun vine to grow with sweet foliage and you get a little little bonus of some of the small little kiwis on there the fuzzy ones, obviously, what we'll find in the store, and that's going to be again traditionally a he and a she. But now we would go get the one I mentioned earlier called Sweet and Solo. So that's one that we would plant the one plant, and we'll have production on its own. We don't have to worry about having a second second variety in there. The Kiwi Magic is a great hardy one, so I can grow 
you know, fuzzy kiwis always been kind of right on the borderline around here. They've gotten down to like zone six or seven, which I'm comfortable with selling. I don't think you'll ever lose that here in the winter. The Arctic kiwis and the hardy kiwi is a different creature. We're going down there 20, 30 below zero where I can grow those pretty much anywhere I want and never worry about winter hardiness. Same again, great flavor, but just a little bit smaller, uh, smaller sized fruit to enjoy. Now there's the big one, blueberries. Yes. Uh, on the kiwis, can you have a self fertile with a non? Yes. Can yeah. they would pollinate each other? So if I had, that's usually what I've been telling people the last two years now these have come out, is if you don't know what you have, get one of the self fertile ones and hopefully your female's left and now you'll get double fruit on both. If not, you've still got the male there, extra pollen, and, and either way, you're going to win. So, because that's a hard one. That's a really common uh, question I've got over the years. Like, <coughs> moved into a house. I'm a good gardener. I know it's a kiwi. Which kind is it? You know, there's just no way to tell again unless we again look at the the flower. We can look at the foliage and tell you what species it is, but we need to see the flower and to know that it's a, a he or a she. Because this is probably. I think it's only two years, might be three when the first one came out. Everything else before that is either either male or female again. Now blueberries is a big one up here. This is a, the perfect easy thing to grow in the Northwest. We have wet, we have acid soil, we have rain, we have bogs, we have mud. I've seen blueberry farms like I mentioned earlier underwater sometimes in the winter. Uh, blueberries are really easy uh, plant to grow. That's one of uh, and one of my faves for, for sure. Um, we always use the organic fertilizer. You heard me mention roadie food. You've got to get roadie food for blueberries. You're going to have much better luck than just using a berry food or an all-purpose or anything else. We want that little bit of extra organic sulfur in there to add acidity to that plant. So use the roadie food. Um, mulch every season. If it was me, and I do this with all my blueberries in containers and the ground, I go out at some point here late winter, clean the debris up, make sure I got no dead, all that. Throw it in the yard waste, put the food, roadie food down, mulch right over the top of that and off we go. Even, even in my containers, clean out all that excess stuff that's fallen in there, throw it in the yard waste, get my food down and I mulch the containers right back to the top and then let that settle down here as we go through the season, okay? Um, they don't mind being wet, so that's a huge one for a lot of people. Like I'd like to grow some berries, but my yard soil's not the best. It's a little wet in the winter. It's kind of squishy here and there. Sweet, get a blueberry. That's an easy answer. The rest of it, not so much that we're going to talk about today, but, but blueberries for sure. Um, you know, a lot of this, we do deciduous. I'm going to show you quite a few blueberries here on the slides, but we do mainly deciduous. We lose our leaves in the winter. Uh, blueberries get spectacular fall colors. So that's a pretty plant in the fall anyway. We drop our leaves, we'll see you again next year. There are some evergreenish blueberries now that we can utilize in our, in our specific area and I'll, I'll show you those here in a second. So one thing to keep in mind, I think we've got really good charts on the website and out in our sales yard on, on berries. You know, it's a little confusing to think, okay, I gotta get two different blueberries to cross pollinate, which we do have to do. You're gonna maximize your crop always especially with old school high bush blueberry farm blueberries as big as me i gotta get two different ones to cross pollinate and we've got early we've got mid and we got late so i don't want to hopefully not confuse you i'll tell you this from experience in all these years is i don't really care which two you get as long as they're the same season or adjacent season so early is okay with mid early is not okay with late does that make sense to everybody i got too much gap in between bloom this isn't like one blooms in march one blooms in april one blooms in may this is about a two week interval here as we get into bloom and produce uh, for ripening in the summer so they'll always overlap enough to get production but try to go to the same season or two adjacent seasons and you'll be fine ours are specifically grouped back there by season frank just put the signs out today to try to make your life easy there are, but we have a bunch in, some really good ones, but there's a lot more coming too. So keep that in mind if you see one up here. Like, man, you didn't even have that one in yet. It'll be here pretty quick. We've, 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 we'll have some more deliveries here in February. Usually by 1st of March, we've got, we've got all maximum selection of blueberries. Um, a lot of the new hybrids can be grown in pots. This is, I think I got three emails before the class. Hey, will you make sure you talk about blueberries in pots? Of course you will, because that's how I grow them now. So you can find some really tidy varieties. It doesn't have to be a gigantic whiskey barrel and a six foot tall blueberry. You can do that too, 
you know, I've got, I've, mine are going on about 12 years plus on my patio. I've got two jelly beans, a great little dwarf one. Uh, they're my, plants are probably only two feet tall, two feet wide. I get an incredible amount of berries on them. And I'm only in a pot now about 18 by 18. I've only had to transplant them once in all these years. So you don't have to have a giant container. We get good aesthetic potting soil. We get the right size container to start with and we can find nice little tidy varieties perhaps to grow in containers for a little bit longer. Uh, the evergreen ones are semi evergreen. You can see up here what's got leaves on it. You know, that's a blueberry, believe it or not. So with our weather kind of warming up here, the last decade or so, you know, we're able to access some of the southern type blueberry crosses that kind of go with both. So these are ones, yeah, we get a brutal winter, just like any other blueberry. It'll turn a little color, drop some leaves, who cares? We'll see you again next spring. On a typical winter here, I'm gonna turn purplish, get some nice color, but I'm not gonna totally defoliate. These have been sitting out here in our cold frame this entire winter, and they look just as good as they did, you know, going into the winter, so yes. Is now a good time to transfer? It all trans yes, transplant anything here late winter. We try to get it done before first of March. Yeah, you want to get transplant done. So if we look at evergreen or semi evergreen, there's Bountiful Blue, there's Sunshine Blue. There's a new one coming out this fall called Bountiful Baby. I'll be excited to see. That would be a great little dwarf to grow in pots. Um, but we can have some foliage and not just have it go bare. So that, that's the whole point. There are some good, good, uh, good evergreen ones. Now, Bushel and Berry is a brand name. I've tried a lot of these. We've carried a lot over the years. I think some are super good. Some are not good for up here, to be honest with you. We play around with them for a year. Like, I'm not gonna sell that to anybody. It just doesn't do it quite as well. Again, maybe a little more Southern state um, application for some of them, but there are some really good ones um, out and about. I mentioned I have Jelly Bean. We'll have a lot of those in here pretty quick. That's a great dwarf one. We get Pink Icing which looks just like this, but it's got more of a turquoisey purple color in the winter. It's got great, not pink berries, but it's, they call it pink icing because it has a little pink on the new growth. Um, we get some other ones in that group that would certainly be worth looking at. You can find um, those online. You know, look up Bushel and Berry. That's a whole berry program that's a patented one out of one particular nursery, and they've got some pretty good, uh, pretty good flavors of many things on there. Um, they're very easy to grow, and again, for me, I was out of room in the ground, so it's like I'm not digging my maples out. I want to add some pots, so we we'll put some more pots in, and then I'm able to take advantage of some of these new genetics and some of the smaller growing blueberries. Um, even some trailing ones. I did not. I'll have a few in. Nobody liked them last year. I thought they were pretty cool. Did anyone get the the sapphire cascade or the midnight cascade blueberries? I see not one. See, that's why I had so many left in the fall at half price, and we didn't order them this year. Um, but that's that's. Part of this program where they came out with a dwarf shorter blueberry that tends to arch and hang and i thought they were pretty sweet people might like them for a hang basket you know or something a little different application versus here's a little shrub blueberry just like everything else so there's bountiful blue <clears throat> um, you'll see that those two to me are ideal to plant together you know if i'm going to get you know, I got a landscape, and I don't, I don't, I don't really want a berry patch. I just want to mix some things into my yard. You know, edible landscape. I'm out weeding in the summer, and I've got a little berry to snack on here and there. You know, these will look like shrubs. They're not going to look like a. Oh, look, you got blueberries all over your yard. You know, I can mix those in with rhodes and pieris and all kinds of shrubs in a typical landscape, and they fit right in just as another good ornamental that I get to pick and eat some fruit off of. So Bountiful Blue and Sunshine would be two great ones to kind of get in the yard together. They would cross-pollinate. Um, they're really close for size, for color, for berry, all that. The main difference is, as you can see on the picture there, Bountiful Bloom has got a white flower, and Sunshine Blue has a little pink in it. So it's a nice little, when it blooms here in a couple weeks, it's got a nice little flower on it as well. <clears throat> so here's some of the the bushel and berry I mentioned earlier. So there's the pink icing. You know, again, a good quality, medium sized berry, but the foliage is really nice. A little different, a little more attractive as an ornamental. Um, if you wanted something that had a little bit of foliage color, uh, there's mine there, the blue jelly bean. When my two young sons don't eat them all, I do get some of those still, though not many last year. They, they pillaged it pretty quick. Uh, but again, two small plants, We've got an incredible amount of berries off that. We're able to eat fresh for a month or six weeks and also freeze a few large bags of them too. So, 
Uh, Blueberry Buckle is my latest addition in my yard, and I have that actually in the ground. So the easiest way to explain this, if you're, you're hikers or out in the woods and you taste a native blueberry, right? They're a little smaller. It's not like, oh, look at that gigantic berry. Most people come in and say, what's the biggest blueberry you got? I want that. We have those too. But to me, the small stuff like buckle or native blueberries, really complex flavor. I mean, if you're not looking for size, but you're looking for the flavor, that to me is unbelievable. My, my wife tasted those for the first time last year. and She's like, get more of those, please. Because it's... They're small and you gotta get a whole bunch of them, you know, to kind of make up for the size of, of large blueberries, but very delicious. Those are, those are, that'd be a great one to go. Um, it's like the size of a little boxwood. They don't get very big either. <clears throat> there's a couple, if you want a trailing one, let me know and I'll get them back in. But there's like your Midnight Cascade, the Sapphire Cascade, you know, just a little different growth habit on those. And then some fun ones. And I don't have either of these yet. They'll be here pretty quick, but um, the pink blueberries seem to be real fun. My wife likes them because she can throw them in the fruit salad. And it's like, what is that thing you got in there? <laughs> tastes just like a blueberry. It doesn't taste any different, but it's pink. You know, it's kind of fun to, to mix in with the blues. So we get a bunch of pink popcorn. Uh, Raz is an interesting one to me. Um, believe it or not, it looks like a blueberry. It feels like a blueberry. It tastes like a raspberry. So it's got a different flavor to it. If you like maybe a little more raspberry flavor with the blueberry, that's kind of a fun one I've tried. Uh, did enjoy that um, now if I'm gonna go big who, who came here like I'm buying a blueberry and I want the biggest thing that's ever been known to earth I want like one the size of a pancake not quite that big but uh, we can get up there like nickel size on some big blueberries and maybe not the steroid ones I see at Casco on the bins once in a while but um, you can get some pretty big blueberries around here I just wrote on there big old blueberries if I'm going big those are the top two right there. Right? We got Chandler and we got Spartan. Those are two that would get ginormous as far as berry size. A uh, couple other ones. Um, bonus and the new one this year is called Huron. You can probably guess Huron. Where's that? Great Lakes, right? So upper Midwest is big blueberry country, um, kind of like the Northwest. Acidic soil, the moisture, all the rest of it, super hardy because it's cold. Um, you know, Bonus has got the record for most production on a plant. So that would be the one if we're growing commercially, going for big berries of excellent taste and a huge amount of them bonus. And now Huron's the second one of that. Those two are at the top of the list for production numbers. If I remember right, they were talking about 12 pounds off one plant um, in, back, in, back in the Midwest. So we've got lots of those coming here pretty quick. Uh, Cabernet Splash is another one that's a little different. Um, it's still a high bush, still great quality berries, nothing changes, but that one I get some foliage color. So you can see in the picture there, much more burgundy, purplish leaves, and that does not go away. So I leaf out that color, I get green in the center, but I can walk out in August and I'm still going to have that whiny purple colored foliage on the tips, which add, again adds a little bit of interest um, in the landscape. So any questions off before I flip here? Quick blueberries, yes. Uh, I, I have blueberries in a pot. Uh -huh. um, and during that really cold weather, I can't take them inside, just cover them or what? I, I wouldn't even worry about covering them to be honest with you. I mean, again, I, if we talk zones, you know, these two are like zone six, like 10, zero degrees, 10 below zero. I hope we never get 10 below zero. That's not gonna happen. But single digits, I'm still okay with those outside. If it's a high bush blueberry, we're talking down in the 20, 30 below zero range. You are never going to worry about damage in the winter time. Well, I've I have, never. I dwarf variety. Same matter. thing. I've never done anything to mine ever in the winter time, and I, I wouldn't even worry about mulch, you know, doing any protection on the blueberry. Yes. Two things. On your trailing ones, you could always put those little telescopes. Yep. Together. Yep. And also, what about honeyberries? And how are they related? Well, they're different. We'll do honeyberries here in a little bit. Okay. Yes. Cut your back. Um, <clears throat> well, let me just say this. So, because blueberry pruning could take a while. Um, watch that video if you can, because it was a little more in depth. There were some good pictures on there I showed. But if I have a blueberry, let me just grab a small one here. Because <clears throat> it's all, it's to me, pruning is all about not, you know, we don't have to be a, a botanist or a botanical genius to figure this out. But what happened last year? I grew up a stem, right, that came off old wood. That is the only point that I'm going to get bloom 
and then production on this season, okay? So if I go out in the winter time and I shave this thing out, this plant's not gonna care, but you just cut off almost all of your blooming wood that you get no berries that year. Is that making sense? So if I'm planting a blueberry, <clears throat> I'm attacking it down here at the base. I'm going down here to the ground level and I might have a big old rangy six foot tall, 50 year old one. It doesn't matter. I'm looking for the oldest, gnarliest wood, not up here, that I can get into that base and saw out or cut out and open the whole thing up. Does that make sense? Because I want more off the root system. That's how I get fresh wood. I cut that off of there, builder shoot shoots up, starts to develop some structure. Now I've got the next generation of branching that doesn't make sense. Is that, is that kind of making sense? Okay. So it's not, you know, this is a tough one if we do evergreen because I'm going to let this flower. I'm going to let it maybe produce, I'm going to pick it, and then if I'm going to prune it, I might shear it lightly because I still have enough summer to regrow, set flower buds, and I won't skip a year. Does that make sense? This, I never want to top because, again, I'm going to cut off most of my, my blooming potential, so I'm going to always attack it in the center. Okay, a couple more. Yes? Two different varieties. If we're talking cross pollinization, I have to have a Chandler and a Darrow or a Sunshine Blue and Bountiful Blue. I want two different blueberries to cross pollinate each other. Oh, okay. okay. Never, never, if I go buy two Chandlers, you'll probably get some berries on a you know a little bit of berries, but you're not going to get anywhere near your potential. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yes. One more. And, and also, with, um, as far as the um, phase, whether it's the first and middle or the yeah, 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 yeah. And remember, because you'll see them out there early, mid, late. And as long as we stick with the adjacent seasons or the same season, we're okay with the pollination. Okay, so let's go do raspberries here. Now, who's got raspberries? Who's got too much raspberries? Leave your hands up. Uh, so raspberries is one of those creatures that will never stop coming. If you have raspberries, you have rows of raspberries, which becomes a patch of raspberries, which will become a yard of raspberries <laughs> if we don't contain it somehow. So raspberries grow very fast. Um, it's all about the root system. You see this above ground, you don't see the mass of roots underground. And that's how brambles and raspberries as one is gonna spread and propagate itself. So the big thing when you're choosing raspberries to me is consider A, when do you want to pick them? You know, most if you go to a pick farm, maybe you're making jam, you're making preserves, you're freezing. Maybe you just want to do one big batch a year. So I'm looking for June bearing raspberries. You know, I want one big crop I can pick, process, do what I want and move on to the next thing. If you're like me and I like a little bit in June, but I also want to pick some over the summer and fall, then I get Everberry, okay? So those are the two types of raspberries we have to choose from. They're gonna grow the same, but I'm just gonna have a little bit different production and a little bit different pruning on as well, okay? The big thing with raspberries around here is we have to have good drainage. I would say 90% of all issues that come into me to look at for raspberries is bad soil, too wet in the winter, root rot, anthracnose, it goes on. All of it is caused because it's too wet down in the ground. This is not one we're gonna dig a six inch trench above hard pan clay, throw a row in and expect it to thrive. It's gonna crash and burn, to be, to be brutally honest. So I wanna break it up, a lot of compost, build it up, even off your ground if you want to. I don't need three feet of soil that drains well, but I need a couple feet, 18 inches, 24 inches, and I want to make sure that water is going through there. I don't want any standing water, especially here in the winter time. Okay. Um, I would always do a support. You know, typically raspberries will arch up six, eight feet. Kind of depends on how you prune. But I'm going to get, I don't need anything fancy. I always just took two posts, farm posts, wood posts, whatever you want. Run a nice sturdy wire. And I can have rows on both sides kind of arching over. Is that kind of what, what most people do, I think? You need something to support them on. You don't want just raspberries flopping out. You're gonna have raspberries all over the place. Um, again, these spread by roots. <clears throat> so if I'm gonna try to contain my row, I'm gonna have to do some chopping, some spading, some digging, put a barrier in sometimes might help um, as far as keeping those roots to spread. But if you're an OCD gardener like me and you like your nice tidy row that you can walk down and pick your berries, you're going to be doing some pruning and some root pruning and specifically to tell that raspberry where to grow and where not to grow. All right, real quick. If you tried to do the barrier, how do you 
If you got if you went and got bamboo barrier, it'd be like bamboo. Something probably 18 inches down, you could slip that in the soil, and you probably eliminated a bunch of your maintenance long term um, doing doing it that way. If I could do mine again, that's what I would do. I would eliminate one more job for the winter time. Um, the biggest thing again, I'll just mention pruning real quick. June bearing raspberries. Let me just grab one here so I can kind of show you. <laughs> So here's an example. We tend to get, I don't do bare root anything berries anymore. You know, I ran whites for almost 20 years down Linwood. I've been here 12 now. I see Swanson's advertised bare root and it's not as good as price as you think it is. Um, some of the nurseries, but I'd rather, I'd rather eat some fruit this year. I'm going to speak for Alia, but if I'm going to plant this sweet, I'd like to go out and pick some berries this year. I buy a little chunk of bare root. I'm going to wait a while. I mean, I'm just not like I'm going to get any sort of instant gratification. So we tend to get older plants that are instant ready to go. I'm gonna have fruit right off the bat. So this is an older one here in a two. We get gallons too that'll produce as well. But this has got old wood. So this is uh, one called Heritage, <coughs> which is a uh, ever bearing by chance. But let's pretend that this was a spring bearing. If I go out in the winter and I cut down my wood, what are you guys gonna guess what's gonna happen? I don't have the wood from last year. I'm not gonna get my bloom and I'm not gonna get much berries to pick that June, right? So if I have a June bearing, I'm going to pick it, then prune the living daylights out of it if I want to. Then I've got all summer for it to regrow, set wood, and I'm back at business next year. Does that make sense? If I have ever bearing, I've, I've got both kinds of wood. The old wood I leave gives me the early crop. The wood that grows out that spring and summer gives me the late crop. Is that making sense? So you can kind of dictate your pruning on, on what you want to do. Sweet, I don't care about as much in June I need to prune, let's cut it back. I still have some berries to pick later. If I have a June bearing one though, and I cut it off, I'm not gonna have much that season. So that's why we wanna kind of prune after we pick on some of those June ones. Now the big thing this time of year, uh, to me would be thinning. If you've got an old raspberry row, and you're trying to get it back into shape, it's probably a thicket. You know, if you haven't touched it for a while, I hope mine is, um, and it'll get devastated here pretty quick is I'm gonna, I wanna take at least one of every three out at the ground. I'm not cutting this in half. I'm not clipping little pieces here and there. I'm going all the way to the ground, looking for the oldest, gnarliest wood, saying you're out of here. Because again, now the root system sends me another shoot and then another one, and here we go with that constant replenishment of fresh canes, which means more berries for us. Is that kind of making sense? Because it's. I think some people struggle with, with pruning them they're always going to grow. If you know raspberries, you're not going to be able to stop it from growing. But if we want to maximize our production, we want to keep that in mind. Am I picking it once a year, twice a year, and then pruning it the right way accordingly? Okay? Question. Yes? No, my neighbor gave me some that I planted two years ago. Yep. They did really well two years ago. And, but I, I don't know what kind they are. Well, you will find out. I mean, if you're walking out, you know, and I don't mean June is always the month. It depends on the weather. But if I'm only walking out and I'm only getting berry production in June, July, that's all I have. If you're going out and getting a little bit and then a little more in that August, September time frame, then you've got ever bearing for sure. So here's a few, <coughs> excuse me, that I'll just show you. And you see the fancy J I put on there. What do you think that means? June, only one crop. So raspberry shortcake is a, a unique creature. We'll have a bunch of these in here pretty quick. I know have some people tried these. I know I have some. Oh, not, yeah, I've got a couple. Uh, this is a dwarf raspberry and thornless. So if we don't want to put on body armor and we don't want to bleed as we're out there picking raspberries, um, that's a pretty easy one to do. This is one I can grow in a pot. It can grow in a small space in a tidy garden. You're only talking about something's going to get a couple feet tall is all. It still is a raspberry, so keep that in mind. Roots spread, more canes. It will take over an area just like a regular raspberry will, but much shorter. Great berries, but just the, the, the one time a year in June, okay? If we look at these, like fall gold, I brought one up. Any, anybody try golden raspberries? So very, very sweet. I, I like a little tang myself. I'm not, it's not my favorite. Doesn't mean it's not yours. Everybody's got different likes. Um, they're not they're bad, they're delicious, but to me, almost like pure sugar. They're super sweet when we get into golden raspberries. And I like a little bit of tang, so I tend to stick with the red ones. But fall gold 
is always going to be a really big fall crop a little bit maybe in early summer but the majority of my crop is going to be in that august september time frame i'll get it in just a second we'll, we'll do all the raspberries and then we'll do questions um heritage is an ever bearing one we have those in in fact that's the big one i just brought over here that's a great old classic um raspberry big berries heavy producing and that would be a good evergreen or ever bearing choice uh, Willamette, I always kind of smile because one of our staff would call that Willamette. It was like, where are you from? <laughs> so that one I'll always smile when I see it. But uh, that is the number one planted raspberry in the, entire, in the entire world, to be brutally honest. If you're buying a raspberry to you pick farm, this goes back about 70 years, I think, with Willamette uh, raspberries. Uh, that's one that um, you're going to see it pretty much every you pick farm. That's a great classic raspberry. It's a June bearing one, again, the one crop, but that's a very popular one. Uh, can be is another one June. I think is probably the best one for homeowners, to be honest with you. If you're looking for June bearing, that's a little bigger berry. I won't say thornless, but that one's much closer to not, again, body armor and blood when we're out there picking. Um, it's got a little less thorns on it, and that's a little bit bigger berry than Willamette. Camby's, you can tell all these are northwest because Camby's a little town down, down by Portland. Um, Cascade Premier, Cascade Harvest. Again, Cascade to me speaks right here. You know, Cascade Gold is another one we'll get in off and on. These are all ones, again, bred by northwest universities for A, a little better disease resistance, a little better wet tolerance was huge with me. Um, and again, a lot of the farms have gone to this series of raspberries as well um, locally here because again, a little bit more just for our climate. Uh, Crimson Knight, I'll have in here pretty quick. And I thought that was my favorite one last year. We'll do questions here in just a minute when we're done with raspberry. Um, Crimson Knight, a little darker, darker fruit. Um, that was one of my favorites when we tasted those a few years ago. So I searched that one out. I don't have it quite yet, but it'll be here just a couple weeks. We'll have a batch of those. Um, Indian Summer is probably at the top of my list for Everbearing. It may not be yours, but that's the one we sell the most of for ones that want Everbearing. That would give me June and then again a big crop in the fall, um, which is when we like to hoard and stash our berries for the winter time, right? So, oh, well here, before we do that, so let's do, get a couple of raspberry questions here real quick. Yes? Does that golden one, the fall golden, will mm -hmm. that go in a pot? Um, all the raspberries we grow in a pot, but because again, I keep saying it's all about the root system. If I'm going to grow any of these in a pot, including raspberry shortcake is a common choice. I've got a few years before I have to take it out, chop it, divide it, put some back in and then give some to some friends, move them around the yard, make more pots or something because you're going to run out of soil, a lot of root system. Yes. So she asked about multiple times. That's a great question because I, I, I should never assume. Raspberries are also fertile. I don't have to worry about any double variety I can pick. I can buy 101, which is what I did years ago. Um, you can pick your favorite or mix up some different ones. You want to do different flavor, but it's not going to affect production at all. Yes? Uh, when it comes to spraying, can you use a dormant spray on these like this time of the year? Yep. And then when would you, could you spray again, but you'd have to be more careful with those? Well, again, when we're doing edibles, we're a, only using natural organic. We never ever put systemic because you don't want to eat that stuff when you pick your berries. So we're using mild chemicals and there's absolutely 10, 12, 15 different things in there that I could use all the way up to harvest and not have any poison or chemical that I'm going to ingest. So we could use the uh, oil spray, dormant spray combination? <clears throat> you can use that through most of the year. When it gets really hot in the summer, there are some other things probably that would be a little better. Um, the one thing I'll say, you know, maybe is what he's getting. Are you worried about flies? Because I know yeah, I did last year too. Yeah. Um, the best way to attack any, there's a fruit fly. Drosophilia is the one that's been getting into most everybody's berries, including mine. Um, that, the easiest way to do those is get the traps. I'm going to hang them in my plants this year and not even worry about it because you're never going to be able to spray that fly. The, the fly comes in, lays her egg, she's gone. You're never going to be able to get her with the spray. Once the egg has been laid in the fruit, it's done. You know, you can't, we can't rescue it. I was using uh, uh, the vinegar traps. Yep. With a, you know, uh, a little bit of dish detergent. Yep. The uh, apple cider vinegar. Yep. And that's doing something. Well, me. well, it helped. And, and that's one option. What we would have in our store, we already have them in, is actually a pheromone 
So it's a sticky trap. You just hang out by the row and it's got pheromone that will actually attract that particular fly and get stuck to the paper and you catch them all. She doesn't have a chance to even lay eggs. Okay. Yeah, any quick more raspberries? All right. So on to brambles. Wait a minute. Yes. Uh, black versus red raspberries. Okay. That's actually, I'm, I'm glad you asked because that's a great question. I try not to bring up negative things. Um, I, who's had black raspberries? Anybody? They're really good to eat. I mean, they really are. The, the problem with black raspberry, and I don't sell any of them, I'm going to be honest. I just don't carry them in here. Um, we've had them a couple times. I can get them for you if you want. The black raspberries are the worst for disease, period. And I found if you're trying to grow black and red, I wish you luck. I mean, it's just a tough combination. If I'm going to do black, I'm going to go put those over in a totally separate area, nowhere near where I'm growing red, because the chances are that's going to have a problem, the reds won't. And if you have them mixed together, you're asking for trouble. So I'm not saying you can't grow them, because you can. A lot of people do. But I would watch a lot more for disease, for spraying, for drainage, air, sun, all the rest of it to keep it to a minimum because they are much worse up here in the wet springs for, for disease. Okay. All right. So brambles. <clears throat> now, again, I keep bringing up the half joke about body armor and putting on some like rose gloves and I don't really want to bleed. I probably got some Marionberry scars from last summer still healing. Um, and I would still pick them because this is some of my favorite ones to eat. Um, but you'll see a lot of thornless on here. So if you want to make your life easy, get thornless boysenberry, get thornless blackberry, get thornless this. You're not going to have to put on the body armor and the gloves when you prune and, and pick and the rest of it. Um, some things there are no option like Marionberry and I'll never quit growing those. Um, but most of the other stuff now we can get thornless. Uh, varieties and not have to worry about um, having having so many thorns on there. So thornless boysenberries up there first. Um, we have so we have those in. I got one of them over here. Don't have any thorns. If you know boysenberry, a little bit bigger. Um, I like a little tang on my berries, so those are my some of my favorites versus super sweet. So boysenberry, berry and blackberries, all that stuff. Um, but thornless boysenberries, a little bigger. Um, it's certainly an easy one to grow. That's one we always have. I'm trying to find some more tay berries yet. Anyone had tay berry before? Yeah, that's a great berry. That's a blackberry raspberry cross. Um, so it looks like a big red blackberry. Um, they're delicious. Yeah, really good for pies. Um, but tay berry is one that we'll have in eventually. We always end up with a few, um, but just one we don't have in quite yet. Uh, Marion blackberry, or we just call those Marion berries, a specific variety of blackberry. <coughs> that's the number one all time on my list. Hopefully my mother's watching online when she watches recording because she makes the best Marionberry pie ever. So Marionberry is the way to go. Um, some new stuff here you'll see on there Prime Arc Freedom. That doesn't really, the name doesn't resonate with anybody. Arc means Arkansas. These came out of a University of Arkansas breeding program. But it's the same idea. They got, this is the first blackberry that will produce twice a year. So it's like the raspberry discussion. With raspberries, I could always have every bearing. With brambles, I got one, and that's it. I couldn't have blackberries all grow from primocanes or floricanes. The growth comes up one year, I get a piece of wood, does nothing. The next year, it blooms, I pick it, and then you cut it out and it's done, right? Everybody making sense to everybody? So that's the one that I would get old wood bloom, pick that as another piece grew out that spring, that blooms later in the summer to fall that I pick again. Is that kind of making sense? So if you want to double your blackberry pleasure, you can try some of the newer ones here and, and potentially get two crops a year versus just the one. Oh, so brambles, I'll show you a couple uh, that I brought in here and this will kind of give you a, a few examples. So like you'll see, I'm trying to remember the name, like we were talking about the bushel and berry program, right? You'll see that online, you can find, we'll have a lot of it in. They've got their own thornless super blackberry. I think it's called Baby Cakes is the name. They have terrible names on this stuff. So Baby Cakes. This is the one we stock, which isn't much better name. It's called Superlicious. See how, how does that sound? So this is one by Monrovia. And again, this is an old blackberry. I got, I got to have one thorn on that plant. You know, this isn't the, excuse my French, the crap that's growing around here in the ditches. Not that those are bad blackberries. This is not that at all. This would be what we would get at a restaurant 
gourmet dessert, the rest of it. Much bigger berries, much better quality than, than we would have on our native or non-native blackberries. So Superlicious would be one to look at. Great in a container, doesn't get as big, I got no thorns. This is one I could put in a pot, you know, and grow three or four feet tall and that's it. You know, have a great little crop every year to enjoy. If we looked at, here's our thornless boysenberry. Look at that, already leafing out. You know, same thing. I've got some nice wood from last year. I'll get some blooms, some production on that. Um, but this is one again, no thorns type of bramble. I think I got one more here. That's Marion. That's a Marion berry, and those ones do have thorns. And then I think this is your this is your Columbia Star. That's a new one that we just got in this year. Again, Columbia, you can tell local Northwest. But that's again thornless, big, huge gourmet blackberries. I don't have to worry about a the picking because I don't have the thorns. And again, more of a Northwest uh, type blackberry as well. Yes. They don't like wet feet either. They don't. Um, you know, I should say it's a little bit like the raspberry, but probably a little bit easier. These aren't super crazy with root system. Maybe like raspberry, they do they do spread by root, but not as bad as raspberry. I don't need this. I probably need something like chest level, you know, same thing, two posts, simple little wire, I can have my plants growing up and kind of arch over that wire to keep them, otherwise they're just going to trail across the ground, be a little harder to pick, but I can set up a real simple row um, and then go out, and again, if I'm picking the brambles, I'm going to have most of these except for the two I talked about, I'm going to have one big crop, so if I'm out there picking you'll see where you pick the flowers dry those canes usually die out i could just prune those out of there now if i wanted leaving each wood each year because i pick that the next year and the next year we kind of follow that cycle as they grow i don't have to worry about doing a major prune i can always tidy the top and cut a little piece here and there to keep it contained but again it's more about going to the base and taking out the big pieces that have already produced so i keep getting fresh growth off the root system that way Yes. Question on your berries growing in pots. Yeah. Um, I'm back here, so when you do this, I can't see. What size pot uh, would, would be suitable? Well, if you know all all this stuff, if you know you don't have to get a whiskey barrel to start. Yeah. So if I'm gonna do this, I'm probably looking for something maybe 16, 18 inches wide and tall, kind of to start with for a few years. Maybe down the road, I've got something two by two. Um, you know, maybe a blackberry or one of these and. 10, 15 years, yeah, if I'm not gonna divide it and I wanna just keep it a pot, I'm gonna get a whiskey barrel, like a half barrel size planter. 18 inches in diameter, how deep? About 18 deep too, yeah. I mean, again, my, my stuff's all in about that, or two by two now, okay. um, and I'm good for a lot of years. We don't wanna do this every single season, but you don't have to plant, you know, one plant in there and, you know, you know, let it sit in there and swim in soil for the next decade. You can get a kind of a medium size and maybe years down the road, move it up, and you can always divide them too, so, yep. Yep. Yes. These are self-fertile as well? Yeah, all brambles, again, self-fertile. I should just always say that. The only only thing really we're talking about today um, is kiwi. There's a couple, uh, one more at the end, but, but kiwi is the main thing. We have he and she. All the rest of this stuff, we don't have to worry about um, a male and a female. Yes. I may have missed it, but uh, mine were going crazy, and I got tired of them grabbing me every time I go by. I yep. hadn't pruned them earlier. Yep. So I just kind of whack them. Yep. Now, did I get rid of all my... Well, it's probably not going to hurt the plant. They're going to grow. But yeah, you, maybe you cut some of your production off. As long as you've got some wood from last year, you're still going to get some. Yeah, and that's, that's always the, 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 the game is, do I leave this, leave that, leave this much? And you still get some that way. It's not going to hurt the plant, though. Right. Yes? Um, I love wine berries and also the ground cover raspberries. Yep, yep, yep. Arctic raspberries are fun, yeah. I, you know, it's kind of funny because I wish if more people wanted these, we would get them. I, I was carrying, they call them Arctic raspberries. They're super delicious little mini raspberries. They grow like a little ground cover. Um, there's all kinds of fun little berries to try um, that do great around here, but it's just at retail, it's all about popular demand. If I buy a bunch and nobody touched them, then I'm not going to probably get them again the next year. Yeah, I have some yellow ones, and if anybody, you know, started growing them, they'd realize how wonderful. Yeah, they're really good. Great. Yeah, really, really good. You don't want to have a normal. Yep. All right, so we'll look at some other berries here now. Um, you know, and some of this we have in, other ones I'm still kind of waiting for. Is anybody doing goji berries? You got a couple? I have one. Yeah, goji berries are fine on their own. I don't have to worry about two varieties on those. 
Um, we get Crimson Star. Which one did I get this year? It just came in. Actually, we got the original species, which is kind of cool. There's a goji berry plant. We have to get those out of California. The one up here grows them, so that one is sitting in one of the houses here. Not in the greenhouse, like heated at 70 degrees, but they leafed out so early. I'm going to leave them in here until we get past frost because they'll get nipped if so we get it. normal a... to not be leafed out, right? No, it should not be leafed out if that's in your yard. Yeah, those are about a month ahead of time because we have to get them up from a place in Northern California. So, um, so that's goji. Um, they are one of those super fruits, you know, super antioxidants, all the fun stuff we read about online. Um, they're easy to grow as long as, again, I've got good drainage, have to have maximum sun on those. We're not going to try to cheat, put those in shade. Um, and it is, a, it is a fun little berry to try. Um, that one's always going to be around. Um, somebody already asked about honeyberries. Um, I have a couple. I thought I brought one up here. Oh, I did. And again, they leaf out pretty early. This is something that's in the honeysuckle family. Has anyone tried honeyberries? Some people call them hascaps. God, there's like four or five names I've seen online for them, depending on if you're a little Northern Canadian, Eastern Canadian, American, they all have different names for them, but it's the same, uh, same plant. So this is a, it'll look like a blueberry a little bit, but it's oval and the taste, it's almost like all the berries mixed together, to be honest with you. It doesn't taste like a blueberry. They got kind of some really cool flavor. Um, they're really easy to grow and super hardy. This is something that you would be up there like in the 30, 40 below zero range. Um, super, super hardy. Most of the production of these type of berries is up like Northern Alberta, Northern, way up in the Northern cold areas in Canada. Um, we can grow them around here. Again, if we have decent drainage, good sun. My one concern with honeyberry, especially those who are tucking them in shade, is mildew. It never tends to affect the fruit, but the foliage doesn't look so swell in the summertime. If we've got bad air circulation, not enough sun, we might find a little bit of mildew on them occasion in our specific climate. Uh, but they produce really easily. The honeyberry is the other one I mentioned that we have to have two uh, to cross pollinate. We can't just do one honeyberry. We've got to match two different varieties together. Um, this is a little bit of a confusing one to me online. I spent some significant time this winter trying to figure out what was wrong and what was right because you know we're getting into more people wanting these and it's a really hard one to say, yeah, take this and this, put them together, you're good to go. Um, they're classified kind of like blueberries where we've got our early, our mid, our late. And so I tried to make it easy this year. Everybody wants food early. So I got all earlies. So we will eventually, we'll have four kinds of these from totally different places, but they're all interchangeable as far as picking two. The last couple of years, it just it was confusing our staff. It was confusing our customers. Which one do I put with what again? Because we kind of had two and we sell out of one and then I didn't have anything to go with that one. So this year, made it easy. Just get any two kinds of the ones you see at Sunnyside and you're all set. You've got berries on both of them. So, so that's that's our honey berry or half scap. You can come up and look at the picture. Monrovia well, always has great pictures on theirs, but it, it literally does look like an oval blueberry. A little, little bit, a little bit different taste though. Yes. What kind of fertilizer for honey berries? This is one again. I'm going the the blueberry. I'm going roadie. Everything else, I'm going for that fruit berry vine food. Yeah, for sure. We don't need to build up um, any acidity. In fact, that was the, one of my qualms about getting these in in the first place years and years ago. Is you know, this is growing in, in honestly, eastern Washington, Alberta, the opposite soil of what we have. They don't mind acidity at all, so I'm okay selling them here. But this is a chalky, alkaline, typical berry, so we don't have to worry about acidifying yeah, the soil at all. Okay? Now, grapes. Who's got grapes? Anybody who's doing grapes? Nice. Making some wine or some table grapes? Table. Or both, right? No. So grapes are always easy. Um, there's probably not a plant that looks more dead in the winter than a grape. If you have a grape, you're like, I don't know, is it gonna leaf out or not? You can hardly even see buds on the thing. Um, the biggest thing first is A, we talked about the pruning at the other class, but you've got to cut that grape back. I mean, grapes are a big old vigorous vine, gonna cover some serious area. I get rid of anything skinny in a pencil. All you want is the old chunks of wood. If you drove by any guy, or lady growing grapes or wine or anything, it's like bones eye almost. You look yeah. at those rows and you're like, you got all that off that because you don't need all that mess. You just need the old wood. That's what's gonna bloom. 
and actually give me my bunches of grapes to enjoy. Um, this is a tough one, I'll be honest, in Western Washington. We can grow them great, it's not that, but accessibility for you guys, the homeowner, is brutal. Um, us nurseries don't have nearly enough money to battle the wineries, and so most of your grapes are not accessible to grow in a home in a lot of areas now in the country. If you, if you live in a county that's producing some wine or has a big winery, they're going to severely limit you on what you can plant in your yard or what I can sell to you to plant in your yard. So virus, these are all virus indexed. If I have grapes come in, I pay a lot more for them now because we have them genetically tested. They have to be screened. They have to be perfectly clean to come in here to go home to your house. They don't want to take a chance of you having something in your house flies down the road. Now we've got it in the winery. You're the guy making grapes for a living kind of thing. So, um, so forgive, I guess the point of this is forgive us. I'd have every grape if I could, but there's some that I, you're just not going to be able to get much anymore up around here. Uh, we don't do a lot of wine grapes, not that we can't make wine out of any grape, honestly, but um, we're, we just don't do a lot of wine grapes for us at Sunnyside. We're table grape people. <coughs> Excuse me, so slip, slip skin, uh, slip skin seedless grapes is how we go. And we've got some excellent ones in already, and again, some more coming in as well. But I just try to go, what are the couple best greens, reds, blues, dark, or, you know, whatever color you like, we would have a good seedless table grape variety for that. Um, I brought a couple up, which I thought I did. Oh, what? Did I forget? Oh, they're on the ground, that's why. So I brought a couple up. I'll bring this. This, uh, this is Kennedy's, a good red seedless one. But you can see, you know, again, I can see some buds on that old plant. I'm going to get some fruit on this this year. It's the same reason as the blackberry. I don't want to buy a little chunk of wood that I'm going to wait eight years to do anything with. You know, I want to get some grapes like now. So these will actually drop a few clusters the first year for you and then just get better and better with age as they go. So we've got Jupiter, we've got Interlochen, Hemrod, Kennedy's. There's probably five or six back there so far. And again, some more coming in as well. Uh, there's a great chart back there that'll kind of show you size, ripening time, flavor, if you want a little different flavor on them. But um, for us at Sunnyside, again, all good uh, slip skin kind of table grapes, seedless grapes, seedless, uh, seedless grape varieties. You can't, you know, if we kind of, not to turn this into a California discussion, but, you know, we're not going to have Thompson seedless grapes up here. We don't have enough heat to grow those. There's some stuff you'll see in the grocery store. You're not going to have much luck growing in Western Washington, but we can get another slip skin or see this grape just like it that would, that would thrive here just as well. Okay. The slip skin mean seedless? Is that seedless what slip skin, exactly. Yeah, sometimes you can kind of pop it and just eat the center, or they didn't have any seeds in them, so, so good, good fresh. Okay, so there's a couple green ones. Hemrod and Interlochen are both um, my parents have had, I've had since childhood. I mean, those are both my, my dad has grown for years. Um, good old fashioned ones that are great producers around here. Um, if we get into kind of a little darker, uh, Suffolk we'll have in here pretty quick. Black Manuka is a really dark one. Uh, we get those locally grown as well. We'll have those here in, in just a week or so. Um, and again, I've got, I brought Canadese up. We've got Jupiter. You know, I, we've got to luckily have a really good wholesale grower up on Getchell Hill. The Van Claver family. I don't know if anybody knows local wholesale growers, um, but he does a great job, I think, with berries these days. Jack has been searching out quite a bit of uh, good stock that just again for our climate in Western Washington. If we were having this class over in Ellensburg or Clay Elm on the other side of the state, it would be an opposite discussion because we would grow totally different varieties of grapes over on the east side of the state. Okay. So, anybody got any questions on grapes? Yeah. A dark to make jelly uh there's quite a few in fact if you check that chart um there's a couple mentioned jelly on there i know jupiter's one for sure a little bit more blue purple color but there's a few that will make some excellent jelly yeah, absolutely yeah. what kind of soil and how much water so uh, uh, probably i'll be honest probably of all the stuff we talked about today this is going to be more on the drought tolerant side and i don't and I'm not saying you go plant this grape and never water it because you're not going to have luck. But of all the stuff we've looked at so far, or today, period, 
this is probably going to need the least amount of water in the in the dry summers here we want to really watch them when they're young get them established none of that changes but down the road you're probably a little better on your own in the summertime when we've got an old established grape um, on a new plant you know all this stuff on a new plant you know I'd be out there checking it probably once or twice a week here this summer it's not every day if we mulch it properly probably once or twice a week is plenty in that four months of dry weather we get the rest of the year you're not gonna have to worry about it yes am I, am I okay to go trim it now yeah, if, if you have, you know, grape is one I usually wait towards the tail end of winter. Um, this is the perfect time now to early March. They usually don't break bud till a little later um, in March. But again, it's not, you know, it's hard because I don't have an old grape here. But if I have this one up here, you know, I'm not just going to cut it off and let it start over. It'll grow. But I'm going to look for those, those leaves, those old bud sections, two or three buds long. That's what's going to, again, bloom and produce fruit. I don't need all the little tendrils and all that little fine growth. If you want to clean it out, get rid of it. It'll get you air, get you sun, um, and then you'll get fresh wood where you prune anyway. So we can gradually build that structure instead of letting it go crazy. I can almost promise you if you're, especially with grape, maybe what I would suggest, take your fingernail, your pruners, because all this looks dead. I mean, on a grape, for some reason, this is the plant. If I nick the bark, I'm going to have bright green cambium underneath there, so I know that wood's healthy. So sometimes you go out late winter, oh, that whole piece is dead. Let's just get it out of here, compost it, because there's another one waiting to take its place, you know, kind of thing. So check your wood, too. Yes? I've got one. Um, it was there when we moved in, and it's in a bedding type area where there's other plants that are around it. Uh -huh. Not, not gonna hurt again as long as we've got decent drains you won't hurt it to get water yeah all right one more and we're gonna keep going yeah. spacing if you have several if you have several i mean i would never you know commercial growers probably gonna go about four feet in between plants maybe six at the most if you've got you know if you're doing on a fence the typical fence i'd only put one every fence post you got kind of four feet eight feet to grow each direction i think that's going to get you better long term um, you can pack them a little bit closer if you want. We're not going to put a grape start in every 18 inches or three feet. You're going to have a, a mess of vines in a couple seasons. So give them some room to grow for sure. Save a little money and give them a little time. Okay, so a couple other berries here, and I'll cut you loose. So um, I personally love, who likes huckleberries? If you live in Everett, who gets huckleberry slump dessert at Anthony's? I'll raise both my hands. That's the best dessert they do. Um, Huckleberry is a delicious berry. That's a Northwest native, um, something that's meant to grow here. We see it in the woods, we see it in the ditches, we see it everywhere, it stumps in the woods, all over the place, but really easy to grow. Um, I'm gonna show you a couple here because I brought a, a, we do it, we finally got some of these in early. I got three here to show you. So that first one we call box huckleberry, okay? So that's not a native one here. I want to make sure that's clear because a lot of huckleberries are native right in our specific climate. This is the one that we would find more on the Appalachians. So super hardy. It's got the same delicious flavor as our evergreen huckleberry does. But this grows low. This is one right here. It's got a great name. They call these buried treasure. Not like the pirate buried, but like buried treasure. Um, so this is a low kind of spreading plant. I think they're beautiful in the landscape. I have them in my yard as a ground cover almost that you wouldn't even know it was a huckleberry. This isn't crazy. They're not going to take over an area, but I'm going to have a low patch like a foot tall that slowly spreads and kind of mounds. If we were, these were in the house so they didn't get quite as red, but in the winter time this whole thing would be glowing red purple color in the leaves without dropping. It's still evergreen, okay? So that's a fun to me, a landscape plant that we call box huckleberry. We've got regular Vaccinium ovatum. This is our native evergreen huckleberry. I saw, I just got back from the Oregon coast last week and I saw about one billion of these growing yes. everywhere. So this is one we would see in shade and sun, the ditch and the woods, all over the place. And that's got traditionally, again, late summer, <coughs> super dark, delicious berries. They're small, but man, they're delicious. That would give me the dark huckleberry production, maybe three feet tall. And then we have red huckleberry, which doesn't look like much this time of year. My old one in my yard I love, but this is what we would see. Typically, we hiked out in the woods here. We would see this growing out of old nurse logs or stumps. 
typically they grow great I've, mine's been in the ground for years about 20 years now I've had one but I just took an old stump because I kind of want it to look like the woods an old fruit tree I had to take down and I cored out the center plopped the stump on the ground filled it full of potting soil and plopped it in there of course my stumps rotted so now it's got rocks around it kind of looks a little funny but but uh, red huckleberry is an easy one to grow too this one we can do shade so like mine literally receives zero direct sun I will tell you right now that is in the deep dark shade in my little native garden and it's underneath a rhododendron so I still get great tangy red berries on that I turn beautiful color in the fall I get a little taller you know usually up five or six feet on an old deciduous huckleberry but certainly another great berry and a, a Pacific Northwest native to enjoy in the landscape as well okay a more acidic soil or just regular um all this stuff's gonna enjoy a little more acidity okay. the native stuff for sure yeah on the other side there you'll see lingonberries Who, who's had good little lingonberries from scandinavia now that's a cute little plant i'm sorry i think this is a pretty plant in the landscape evergreen look at that I even have a couple of old berries on there um but this is one that i will grow short and kind of spread we would all, i was kind of call these shrublets They're not really shrubs it's not really ground cover just going to give me a little bit of height and spread into a nice little patch of foliage that I'll bloom and get some big old berries on for the ice cream and stuff when those produce a little later. All this stuff self-fertile. I don't have to worry about any of this mixing and matching so I can just plant one and enjoy it. I've done these in pots before as a cool little plant to add to a container. I think it's a cool looking plant. Oh sweet, I get some berries on it too. That's even better. So lingonberries is in that same kind of vaccinium family. Uh, with all of our huckleberries and everything else so you'll see the evergreen ones there in the picture the bright red ones i gotta beat my young son to those next year he stripped my plant in two days last summer <laughs> it's like dude where's all my red huckleberries it's like i ate them sorry okay last one here we got to get you going some this is class is going to be a long one um is strawberries who's got strawberries going you got a few i love my strawberries too um you know Real quick, the things I would consider, it's kind of like the raspberry discussion. If I'm going to pick strawberry, a, a strawberry variety to grow, do I want June bearing? One big crop like Behringer's you pick farm up there. I go to town, grab it all, freeze it, make jam, whatever, and I'm done. Or do I want fresh strawberries repeatedly all summer? I want ever bearing if that's the case, okay? All, all strawberries so fertile. Don't have to worry about getting a, a second variety at all but I want to choose the right variety for me, and it's mainly going to be that. Um, you'll have to give us about two weeks. We had a little miscommunication with our local strawberry grower, and they didn't plant our strawberries on time. So I'm hearing about two weeks, we'll have a huge selection of strawberry starts in again. Um, I don't do bare root anymore. I would say 50% of them don't live for starters, and they aren't really any cheaper now than buying a a grown strawberry that I know you're going to get to grow in the, in the yard successfully. So uh, we'll have a bunch in. The list is on the website. We'll have a few ever, quite a few ever bearings and a couple of June bearings as well, but all good Western Washington uh, Northwest strawberries. So we'll have those in pretty quick. A couple just to show you, um, you know, Albion's an ever bearing one. We have, we'll have those in. Shuxon, just, just north of us, that's one we get in for June. Uh, Mount Hood or Hoods always are going to great Northwest one. Uh, we'll have those in. That's a good single crop. Uh, Seascapes another good ever bearing one. But we again we'll have others in. Um, just look at your the, the the chart will give you information. How big do you want it? They're all going to taste good. I can tell you that. So it's probably just more of how how, how large a bearer you want. Um, and knowing that again it's at Sunnyside here it would be a good good Pacific Northwest variety as well. Um, you'll see the new one, the last one there, and we'll have these in here. It'll probably be more like a month. It'll be a little bit later, but this is kind of the new generation of strawberries. So excellent berry. That doesn't change, but I've got a probably a prettier plant. Typical strawberries. I've got a cute little white flower, right? Look nice when they bloom. You can do hanging baskets. I've got pocket planters I grow them in. Edge of my vegetable garden sometimes gets a few. Um, there's all ways to grow them. These two here really pretty flowers that scarlet bell is a really dark red flower <coughs> and rosy bell is going to be a deep pink flower so maybe you want to do it in a hanging basket or a container those to me are really attractive looking cool plants to have in a pot or a, or a noticeable hanging basket 
and I get to eat them too. So if you want a cool flower, that scarlet bell was pretty sweet. I might end up taking some of those home this year because the flowers were really, really, really different. Uh, the last couple here I'll mention, oh, you know, before we do strawberries. So if you have a patch of strawberries, clean it up. Am I resonating with anybody? Like, I don't know if I want to tackle that. You got to clean up your patch. I mean, I already did mine here about a month ago. Um, you feed them, put compost around them. They don't need acidity, but make sure you don't walk away. We get mildew, rot, slugs, all that stuff is because we leave all that junk around clutter. You got to get in there and clean them up and get that debris out of there. And keep in mind with strawberries, we have mother plants. Okay, we have the plant we bought. I've got three or four years. She's done. She's done, ran out of gas. We're not producing any more berries. So I'm constantly the oldest pieces, yard waste, because all the runners and the new ones just keep it going. I don't have to, have to start over again, but I've got to get those old mother plants out of there to keep the generations going. Okay, is that kind of making sense? Yes. So runners Oh yeah, runners will produce the next season, and then the next year, and then the next year. You can tidy, you don't have to let them run for half an acre, I'm not saying that. But we, we want to leave, most people I've talked to the last couple of years for some reason are like, oh I cut all those off, and I'm like, it's not the end of the world for a year, but don't do it every season because eventually your mother plants out of gas, goes to the compost, and you don't cut all your runners off, now we got to go buy some new strawberries kind of thing, okay? What kind of fertilizer do you recommend? So same thing. We want to. We don't need acidity. So what I just did to my patch and my pots is clean out all the brown leaves, snipped off dead fruit, got rid all the rot, everything out of there. Fertilized it all with that, and then I take pure compost and mulch the patch if you want, or in my pot I tuck some back in the pockets and the top of the container, and off we go for the season. I'll go back one more time in the May and apply the fertilizer again and water it in real well. But I'm not. Won't have to clean them up again until until the fall winter. Yes. For hanging baskets on uh -huh. these uh, scarlet bell, what kind of potting soil would you use in that? So again, again, we don't need we don't need super acidity. So I'm going for that Edna's best. And if you really wanted to give them a kick, we have that ultimate recipe potting soil, which is a little spendy, but it's got all the extra connoisseur kind of things in there. You'll have great luck with regular Edna's grown strawberries for sure. Yes. Well, the depth, um, you know, a hanging basket's not super deep, and I don't need this for strawberry, but if I had, you know, something at least eight or ten inches deep is plenty in a container basket. Most of the strawberry pots, you've got kind of that big narrow with the little pocket planters. We have some back there. Um, that one, again, we don't need a huge amount of depth, uh, but a little bit more room to spread would be better. Yeah. Yes? White strawberries. You know, we tried them. I think we'll probably have that Hawaiian strawberry in again at some point this year. And she asked about white strawberries. Um, I didn't have the best of luck with it, to be honest with you, because I was like, ooh, pineapple on strawberry? I'm all over that. And I just, I didn't get a huge amount of berries. Maybe I should have been more patient. But uh, we'll get them in again. Um, I would really watch the debris on those. I really fought mildew and some rot and things on some of the fruit, um, just to keep them a little extra clean. Yeah. Okay, last couple, we'll get you out of here because I'm running way over today. So gooseberries, uh, we will have some gooseberries in eventually. Those are some thorny creatures if you haven't seen gooseberries. Uh, we'll have some of those in, kind of an old school berry, a little different. Gooseberry pie is not, not my thing, but it is kind of a, something a little different. They're really easy to grow. Um, we'll have those in here probably more like early March. We get those grown for us again and, and avoid doing a bare root. Uh, we do get white currant, black currant, and red currants in. Uh, that's a really popular choice last few years. Um, you know, you make make a currant jelly. Um, I don't know if fresh eating currants not my thing. Maybe it's yours. No offense, but usually jelly is the way to go on that. Um, that's it. That again is a big bushy shrubby plant. Don't have to worry about cross pollinization or any of that mess. But give them some room to grow. And again, if I have currants. You know, all the wood that grew last year is going to bloom and give me the berries here the next season. So we can't go out and do major pruning on those until after we pick or thinning them out like a blueberry would be the way to go um, as far as maintenance. Uh, there's black and there's red. Look at that and I made it. Oh, we did go over a little bit. Um, so you can always, like I said, our 
Uh, Nicole, our marketing director, we sit, spend a lot of time, her and I, in November, December every year, revamping everything for the next season. And you've got all the new lists on there. We have lists out there by the berries, uh, pictures of everything online. You can kind of read about why we carry those specific things. And again, signs on everything back there that will kind of tell you uh, what the best attributes of all these little creatures are. Um, you're always welcome to email uh, the store. Like I've mentioned a couple times already, if you haven't and you need more pruning, you can ask me here after class or jump on the, our YouTube channel. Um, if you're not tired of listening to me, you'll see me chatting about pruning for about an hour in mid-January. We did all the fruit and all the berries kind of as a specific class um, so we could focus on, on more growing them here in these classes. Good? So the last thing I'll say, like everything here, we have um, some good sales going. For those of you, I appreciate you coming into class today. If you just tell the cashier that you were at our uh, berry class, they'll hit the magic button on the register and you get 20% uh, on a lot of stuff today for a nice discount. So all berries, don't care what it is, what size, any kind back there, you got 20% on all that if you want to do some shopping. Both of the fertilizers, that's a good time to stock up on roadie food for 20% off and get it for the rest of the yard. So roadie food, we've got pouches. Um, or bigger bags if you need some of that. That's all 20%. And I also put the the acid mix for the blueberries. If I'm buying blueberries specifically, using it as a potting soil. I, I, is everyone clear on that soil? Because it's getting a little confusing sometimes with soils at nurseries. We only do organic, A. And B, we have these new hybrid soils. So I can't plant in compost. Everybody knows that, right? I could dig a hole, fill it full of compost, my plant's going to crash and burn. That's too much, no structure. That's an amendment that I mix with my existing dirt and I'm good to go. That is one of these new hybrid soils that I can use straight as a potting soil for things like blueberries, azaleas, anything I want to do in a pot. Or I take that bag home, mix that up with my native dirt. I've got compost plus the acidity, the sulfur, and all the extra goodies in there as well. Is that kind of making sense? So that is on a 20% off as well, okay? So berries, fertilizer, good soil. Now you have some good stuff to eat. We'll be ready to go for the season. All right. Okay. So questions. We got any questions? What's the name of that um, blackberry that has no thorns again? This one is super licious, <laughs> but the, the, <laughs> it just makes me laugh. That's the name. The <laughs> but we also get the other one that comes in on occasion is called baby cakes, but you super licious is a great one. Yeah. Yeah.